Uh, again, I am Jane Demner with the Columbia Association, and on behalf of the Columbia Association, I welcome you here to our third public meeting on the Columbia Market Study. Uh, what I would like to do is to make some introductions, talk a little bit about the overview of the study, and then our consultants will be briefing you on what they have found to date. Uh, again, can you hear me? Okay. So the sponsors of this study are Columbia Association, and uh, Howard County Planning and Zoning, and Bill Mackey is with us here tonight, Bill. And Larry Tweel, uh, the Executive Director of the Economic Development Authority. Larry, back up the back. Thank you very much. Uh, so that is the three parties who are involved in, and uh, the clients on this study. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, our elected officials in the audience, and I see Mary Kay Sigany here. And also, uh, Jamie uh, is here, um, Jerry uh, Hoopland from Jen Terraza's office. Thank you very much. And also from Columbia Association, uh, our chair, Andy Stack, is here. Alex Hakimian from Oakland <coughs> and Russ Slotek from Long Reach. Thank you all. And for all you others who are village officials, uh, staff, community members, again, thank you for coming. Oh, and uh, Dylan from Courtney's office, right? <coughs> Courtney Watson's office. Okay, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our consultants tonight. We have Tom Moriarty, our lead consultant, <coughs> and we have Tom uh, Lamache and Patty Fullman, and all of those you'll hear from them tonight. Okay, so tonight's focus is on the market potentials. Uh, what have we learned about the potential for the villages, village centers, and the GEDS corridor? So again, the GEDS corridor is GE, that's the GE part, and then the Dobbin and Snowden corridors, that's what GEDS is. <coughs> and to understand the markets for those areas within the context of greater Columbia and the greater connection to Howard County. So the map just shows dots for the village centers as well as the GEDS areas, which are again um, uh, maybe hard to see, uh, but, but uh, <coughs> uh, that's what it shows. So the next slide, uh, is the, the process is unfolding. Uh, we are now currently um, in the phase three. Uh, so we have uh, some interviews. Uh, the consultants have met with brokers and people who are knowledgeable about uh, what's going on in the market. Uh, they've identified the demand as well as supply uh, and are here to tell us about what they've found. Uh, next month, the 29th, we'll be at the Howard Community College and we will have recommend their recommendations and strategies uh, for addressing some of the things that they have found. So I, I have gone through this. So this is our third public meeting. Um, and again, the, the 29th, which is a Thursday evening. We look forward to seeing you for our final public meeting. Okay, now I'm gonna turn it on over to uh, Tom, and he is gonna to talk to you about method and then about uh, what he's found. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, well, welcome back. Uh, for those of you who've been at our two previous meetings, we appreciate your continued interest. Uh, and we're hoping, th these are sequential and sort of building on each other. So we went from very general in industry trends to what we started to see in the area and some interesting patterns to tonight where we're talking about market potentials, market potentials telling us where we stand today, and then looking at the next session on the 29th, as Jane said, at where we might take it from here with some specific strategies. So. Uh, we have completed stakeholder interviews and have used a lot of our own experience in marketplaces for these real estate land uses. Uh, we used a series of, of data reporting <coughs> services uh, that most consultants and governmental units use. Uh, ESRI, the U.S. Census, CoStar, you'll hear some of these mentioned tonight. We talked last time about STR Global, which used to be Smith Travel Research, a hotel source. Um, we have also reviewed uh, a number of the existing plans, planning documents, data sets, and other information that's been provided by Howard County DPZ, by the Economic Development Authority, and by the Columbia Association. 
Um, we've used a lot of our own stuff and uh, data sources that we use internally for industry trends and what's going on now, uh, looking at capital market trends and so forth that change all the time. Uh, and then these findings and opportunities will be used as the basis for the recommendations we make on the next go-round that happens. Uh, that presentation will be on May 29th. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about uh, mar the market analysis. Um, this is based on primary and secondary data and a lot of the changing competitive characteristics that are happening in Columbia, in Howard County, and in general in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we, we've noted a number of both national and local real estate industry trends. We've looked very carefully at where Columbia sits within Howard County, and we've had some uh, particularly interesting observations about your role in the county as the rest of the county is now developing and catching up because Columbia developed uh, in a coordinated way earlier in many ways than other parts of the county. Uh, we've looked at the, the demographic characteristics of the village centers uh, and of the GEDs, the GE, Dobbin uh, Road, Snowden River Parkway area, uh, and then compared all of that to competitive context, so where do we go from here? So we have these broken down by industry sector. Uh, Tom Lavash and Patty Fulham will be presenting their sections uh, on housing, hotel, and retail, and then we'll come back and talk about GEDs, which is part of the study area, but as you all know, is very different from the village centers and the way it's set up and its land area and its functions and how it's organized. So Tom, if you want to come talk about it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, again, I'm uh, Tom Lavash, uh, one of the sub-consultants on, on the effort here. Um, Scott, if you could hit the next, uh, it's maybe a little blurry, but we're going to we're gonna sort of start globally at 30,000 feet and then hone in on, on some specific numbers. Anyway, one of the really critical sources that we use for commercial real estate market data is uh, CoStar Inc. And CoStar Inc. is a national real estate database that tracks office markets, retail markets, industrial markets in almost every jurisdiction around the country. And they um, evaluate uh, literally monthly uh, trends and, and, and market conditions and inventory on leasing, on rental rates, a whole host of sort of key factors that help guide um, how a real estate market is performing within a specific use. So CoStar, and, and this, is, this is the preeminent use for uh, commercial real estate market uh, data. So CoStar defines the Columbia submarkets in this way. And we realize, we recognize that, for example, Columbia South goes over to beyond the eastern side of Interstate 95. So we, we're, we're calling that broadly Greater Columbia. But we'll hit some numbers for each of these submarkets uh, relative to how specific land uses, such as office space, uh, uh, are, uh, is performing, are performing. So we want to start globally again, and this is for the office market that uh, Howard County contains almost 18 million square feet of office space. That's a, that's a big number. And today, about 2.4 million square feet of that is vacant. That's about a 13% vacancy rate. And from a, a, a capital perspective, from a wall, from, from, if you're a guy on Wall Street and you're looking at a 13% vacancy rate, you want to see it a little bit lower. Uh, uh, before thinking about financing uh, new, new construction. So what this reflects, what this illustrates, is sort of the, the recovery from the 2007-2009 recession uh, as job growth continues, that vacant space is being absorbed or leased. Columbia is fully 81% of all of Howard County's office space. That's an extraordinary number. Uh, about 2.1 million square feet are, are vacant in Columbia, and what Sort of the left column there is broken off a little bit, but within that you see the north, south, and town center submarkets, and you can see the uh, the numbers within within each. South, the area uh, to the south down to the Montgomery County line, is the largest submarket with about nine and a half million square feet of uh, of office space. And what we've highlighted here is GEDs, that special study area that we're looking at specifically, is part of Columbia South. And that has about 2.9 million square feet. It's about 20% of the south submarket. And you can sort of see. Oh, sorry. Well, Trigger okay. So you can sort of see the distribution of how the vacant space uh, splits up here, with south being uh, the, the weakest uh, submarket at, uh, at the current moment. 
want to hit on the last column over. That's the most important number for, uh, for you to remember tonight. And it's the technical term in, in our world that's called absorption. It's effectively leasing. How much space is leased annually um, as a means of tracking what's happening in the market? And Howard County is about almost 400,000 square feet a year. And I always, I always point to ceiling tiles as a means of sort of getting people to wrap their heads around what is a square foot. And in fact, these are one square feet each. So you can imagine 382,000 ceiling tiles. But I also, the, the better way to do it is to suggest what does, how can people relate to a, a specific building in Columbia? Uh, the General Hospital, for example, is 206,000 square feet. So literally, almost two general hospitals a year of office space are absorbed in Columbia on an annual basis. In, I'm sorry, in Howard County. Uh, in Columbia, that 331,000 number, that, that would effectively be, if, if Wegmans were office space, it would be two Wegmans a year that would be leased by the market. While South, uh, Columbia South has the weakest, or, or has the greatest amount of, of vacant office space at the moment, it also has the greatest absorption, the greatest pace of, of activity, which is a good sign because the, the, the presumption is that if that continues, you would uh, quickly lease the vacant space that exists on the ground today. On the other hand, and, and much of that is probably Columbia Gateway and the office buildings that line Interstate 95. On the other hand, within GEDS, for example, you can see the limited absorption, only 4,600 square feet per year, and this is looking at uh, an eight-year window from 2005 to 2013. And we looked, we, we would typically try to encompass within that window multiple economic cycles. So it, it reflects the, the boom of 2005 to 2007, the, re the recession of 07 to 09, and subsequent recovery since um, 2010. We're drilling down further now to look at specifically the village centers. And, Office uses in the village centers are a secondary or a tertiary use. Um, you can see among the eight village centers in our study, about 126,000 square feet, uh, of which less than 10,000 square feet are vacant. It's about a 7% a vacancy rate. Um, that's not a bad vacancy rate, but again, it's a smaller amount of inventory, so proportionally, from a financing perspective, it would be a consideration. Just a couple of other uh, notes. Um, since 2005, more than four million square feet of office space has been, has been built um, in these three submarkets. That's extraordinary. Uh, that's an extraordinary amount of construction. and reflects the overall health and, and stability of, of a Columbia. And if that, that pace of absorption is sustained, at about 330,000 square feet a year, it would take about six years to lease up the, the vacant space to about a 93% occupancy level. And 93 to 95% is typically what the capital markets would look for as, as we define it, or as they define it in terms of uh, stabilized occupancies. Other centers, um, while the vacancies are generally low, uh, Long Reach being one of the centers in the previous table that you saw, uh, having some vacant space, a couple of others. The tenant mix is characteristic of what we call garden office space. It's professional services, the doctor, the dentist, uh, the accountant, etc., that are that draw their business primarily from surrounding rooftops, from surrounding residents. What does this mean in terms of market opportunity? The next step is to say uh, is to is to look at job growth because job growth in, in particular industry sectors, uh, office using sectors, is a critical barometer of demand for future office space. And so we looked at the plan uh, Howard 2030, which suggests that, that Howard County will add about 3,000 jobs per year, um, and in this case from 2012 to 2020, about 24,000 jobs. It's a pretty solid rate of job growth. If Columbia maintains what we call fair share, and today Columbia is 38% of the county's job base, that would suggest that there should be 9,000 jobs, new jobs, in Columbia over the next several years, by 2020. That translates into about 2.2 million square feet of 
what we would call gross demand on the ground for uh, office space by 2020. However, uh, there is 2.4 million square feet of empty space today. Now we don't know whether all of that, or, or what, what portion of that space may be functionally or physically obsolete. But we're going to assume that it's mostly suburban product from 1970s on and is probably marketable. So effectively what this says is that for the foreseeable future, all new job growth that demands office space could be met in existing vacant space on the ground today. Developers, of course, um, like to take risks. And, and presuming that they can get financing, they're going to continue to build. And as a means of testing, well, there will be some new construction. How much remains the question? We've assumed, as a means of being conservative, that 30% of the existing space on the ground is leased up before there's new construction. So that gets you to a net demand of about 1.5 million. So today, if Columbia maintains its fair share of the county, again, it's 81% of all of the county's office space, and if Columbia maintains that share, all of that 1.5 million, that would suggest about 1.2, could go somewhere in Columbia. Now we know that 4.3 million square feet is, is planned for downtown at some point in the future. And if downtown captures fully 100% of that future demand, at that 300,000 square feet per year, it would take downtown 13 years, fully 13 years, to lease up all of its plant space. That, that's a, that's a, a number that we have to consider when we're thinking about development opportunities for GEDS as it competes uh, with downtown, for example, as well as the business center. If we continue that fair share analysis, it would, uh, looking at each village center, the market opportunities suggest it would be fairly limited uh, in the, on the order of two to 3,000 square feet of additional space per each of the eight village centers that we're looking at. So it's a fairly nominal amount. The village centers, from an office perspective, will continue to serve the needs of uh, nearby residents. And, and what it suggests, the implication here, is that uh, the more rooftops you have, the stronger the opportunity for supporting services such as retail and office space. The other, one final point on this slide, if I may. Smaller office buildings are much harder to, uh, uh, to finance. Uh, the garden office product that I referred to, generally five to 10,000 square foot buildings. You see a lot of it around, typically around hospitals where they're filled by uh, medical office tenants, for example. Those are typically harder to finance because they're more speculative. In other words, a, a, an anchor tenant, an anchor office tenant, could go into a larger building and that developer could get that commitment, that leasing commitment, and therefore that's, uh, that's more easy to, to finance. <coughs> Jump to the hotel for, uh, market for a moment. The next slide you've <coughs> seen in our previous presentation uh, that looks at the, the multiple hotels in, in Colombia, uh, there are currently 15 properties with about 1,900 rooms. Um, most are what we call limited service. So the Sheridan in, in downtown Columbia is, in the industry, is defined as a full service property. Typically has a restaurant, for example, uh, a, a full service. Limited service would be the Hilton Garden Inn, a Marriott Courtyard, a uh, Hampton, a Comfort Inn, etc. Uh, this is a pretty price sensitive market. I'll show some numbers momentarily uh, because it's oriented to government uh, uh, per diem rates to government agencies uh, such as NSA. So it's, it, it tends to be price sensitive. Key, in, in a market like Columbia, the key issue related to potential market support for additional hotel will be related to job growth in and office development. So we pulled data, you've seen this slide previously in our, our last presentation, we pulled data from about 1,600 rooms of the 1,900 or so, and the reason that three below were not included, one of them, the, the Hampton Inn in Columbia South, is so new that the data source, STR, that Tom talked about previously, 
waits a year, a full year of operation before they um, uh, release, uh, release the performance data. And, and to protect the propriety, of, uh, propri because it's proprietary data, to protect it, the information on, on the next slide is an aggregate of all of the uh, hotels within 1559. What this illustrates is sort of the key market performance factors for a hotel. Uh, average daily rate, number of rooms, uh, uh, demand, occ annual occupancy, etc. So the key, the key metrics that we as analysts, real estate analysts, use to evaluate the market for hotels. And the most important set of numbers are those that are, are highlighted in bold. The capital markets typically seek sustained occupancies between 65 and 72 percent on an annual basis. And, and your average of all of those 12 or 14 properties in the preceding slide, your average is almost 68 percent. So that's a really solid number. The capital markets, Wall Street, we want to see that number sustained uh, over time. What's interesting here, you can note between 2012 and 2013, uh, the decline in vacancy from 68 to 66 or so, uh, we're struck by that. We think that that is a, a directly attri attributable to the sequester and the shutdown of the government uh, back in October, which of course affected uh, room night demand. So in terms of, of market potentials, the hotel market needs to be sustained between 65 and 72. That, sh that should continue. Uh, we think that there may be an opportunity for a business class product, whether that's a Westin or a Sheridan or a full service Marriott, for example, in downtown. Uh, that the, we understand that the Sheridan, uh, there are plans to renovate the Sheridan downtown. That's a good thing. It's, it, it will enhance and reinforce its, its marketability and competitiveness. And that Columbia, as, as we noted, is, for a hotel, is very oriented to, uh, to business problems. So the more your office market grows, the stronger the opportunity for additional hotel development. We think outside of, of downtown, that the, the next opportunity might be for a more limited service play, again, a Hampton, a, a Marriott Courtyard, for example, uh, in the Getz corridor somewhere, this is not location specific, uh, but the, that the continued growth and health of the office market is key to supporting a, a hotel there. Uh, some tidbits and factoids on the housing market, which are um, all of, will serve as inputs to uh, analyzing opportunity. Uh, this is from the uh, CA's 2010 study, which was an extraordinarily detailed and very thorough study on Columbia's uh, housing market in each village. And of the eight villages that pertain to uh, this particular study, there are about 29,000 housing units. The owner, uh, what we call tenure, about 65% owner-occupied, 30, 31% renter-occupied, and a very low vacancy rate, which is illustrative of the, uh, of the overall health of the housing uh, stock in Colombia of less than 4%. That's a really good number. And that's, that's effectively considered stabilized. Solid average values that are again ramping up uh, from the, the, the depths of the recession. That's a good thing. Illustration of sort of the product mix across each of these eight villages mostly detached uh, or attached units, about a third of which are multifamily units. One important number to take away from this slide, we'll touch on it later, is 1,500. And that's the, the average annual number of housing starts, permits that have been issued by the county for new housing over the last 10 years. That's an important metric. That's a really solid, that's a very solid growth. We also looked at the rental market, and these are some of the numbers from that study. And this is important when we begin to think about what are the opportunities for uh, multifamily. There are 50 uh, multifamily rental communities uh, in Colombia, about 9,600 units, mostly market rate, several mixed income, several subsidized. And this is really extraordinary, and again, illustrative of the overall health of the, of the housing stock and housing market in Colombia, less than 3% vacancy. 
that's a really good number. And it suggests, if I'm a developer looking at this market, that there are opportunities here uh, to do this sort of product. We look at key inputs like uh, monthly rents and on a per square foot basis. These are inputs when we evaluate the financial feasibility of a, of a project. Those are the, the types of inputs we use. And what's noteworthy here is that Columbia is this commands the second highest rental rate uh, in all of Harvard County, just below Elbridge. Um, for planning purposes, uh, Howard County Department of, of Planning and Zoning prepares forecasts uh, uh, for the annual public facilities ordinance uh, for school construction for transportation planning. Uh, this, this isn't necessarily the market response, but it's for planning purposes. And as I understand, please correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's basically what is the county zoned for? What is the capacity to accommodate additional housing? And, and the top section of the, uh, of the chart uh, is population, and we'll get to housing momentarily, uh, but it suggests that between now and 2020 that Howard County will grow by about 41,000 people. That's a growth rate of 14%. Of that, Columbia, the Columbia planning area, as defined by DPZ, will add about 65, 6,600 residents. That over time, since 2000, Columbia as a proportion of the county is, is getting smaller. And it simply illustrates that there is significant growth in outlying parts of, of the county. So it's, it was about 36% or so in 2000, has declined slightly. Um, and if these trends were to continue, if, those, uh, if the population forecast uh, materializes, it will again decline slightly uh, to about 32%. And again, simply illustrates that there is growth elsewhere in the county um, over this period. The bottom part of that table illustrates the number of units for, from a planning perspective that DPZ thinks would be, uh, that could be accommodated in Columbia. And that's about 16,300, that's, I'm sorry, for the county, that's about 16,300 units um, between 2013 and 2020 irrespective of the type of, uh, of, of, of housing product, whether it's multifamily or townhouse or, or uh, single family detached. Again, the county, the, the number from the preceding slide, the county typically authorizes 1,500 units a year. That's been the 10 year history. So you can see how that might translate uh, if 16,000 new housing units are, are built. The bottom part of that, that uh, the table illustrates the type of product specific to Columbia that DPZ is forecasting for its planning purposes. And this would suggest about 2,600 multifamily units. The majority of that, in fact probably all of that, will go downtown uh, because the villages are effectively built out. And a little bit of, of attached product, about 170 units. So we've touched on, on the, the plan, uh, Howard 2030, about 41,000 new residents, about 6,600 in, um, in Columbia. And as we begin to think about where are opportunities for housing, there clearly is limited land in the villages. I think that the, uh, we collectively think that the uh, precedent of this and the success of Wild Lake, the 236 units that are being developed at Wild Lake, will be indicative of market response to potential new housing at other village centers. Um, and, and moreover, in downtown as well. And so the, in, in terms of testing housing demand, what it suggests is we have no comparables to test for housing in the village centers, on the village center sites. And we need to look at the, the success of Wild Lake, as well as uh, Project uh, Paragon at Gateway Overlook for GEDS and how the market responds to them in terms of uh, the, the, the amount of time it is required to lease up. Likewise with downtown. Early on market success would be indicative of future potentials. And if downtown, 5,500 units are planned for downtown, if that is in fact happens, that's fully 70% of, uh, of the plan Howard uh, forecast for household growth. 
threw a lot of numbers on you. We're going to throw some more with Patty Cole. So the, the first uh, slide I want to show you is something you've seen before with respect to the office market. We did the same exact thing with respect to the retail market. And we looked at specifically how the village centers, how the Geds corridor factors in with respect to all of Howard County. And I, I think the, the major point we want to focus on here is the vacancy rate uh, for both the village centers and for the Geds corridor. If we take out Long Reach because of the significant vacancy there with the anchor, we see that the vacancy rate is 3% there and it's about 2 to 3% in the Geds corridor. And these are all very, very low vacancy rates. Anything below 5% is typically a very good sign for the retail market. It indicates that you know, retailers, for some, some retailers might even be having some trouble finding space because the vacancy is so low. Again, this is just vacancy. It doesn't tell you what type of retailers have been filling the space, but it gives you uh, at least one indication that the, mar the retail market is fairly healthy. And then here again, similar to the office market, we drilled down for the village centers. And you can see here, again, if you look at, and our study area includes the village centers and the Geds corridor, as Tom mentioned. So if you look at this bottom square, there's close to 2.4 million square feet of retail space in just the study area, which is a significant amount of retail space. And of that, only 5% is vacant. So again, in the, and this is including the Long Reach Center with the vacancy there. So again, a very good indicator that the retail market is relatively healthy. So next, what we wanted to do was really focus on the village centers and how they compared to each other. So we took the eight village centers that we were looking at, excluding Wild Lake, and we looked at four market indicators. And the first one is competition, and I think this is probably the most telling of all the indicators that we looked at. If you look at the top three village centers, uh, which is Long Reach, Oakland Mills, and Owen Brown, you see the first column is showing you the competition, the number of supermarkets within a five to six minute drive, which is typically the threshold that supermarkets look at. So you see it's four and above for those three retail, those three village centers. And then going out another 10 minutes, which is an, again another the, kind of the outer boundary of what supermarkets will look at, there's over 10 competitive and competitive regional centers that are competing with these village center supermarkets. So that's a highly intensive uh, supermarket com com competitive picture. It's a lot of trade area overlap. You know that a lot of these village centers are close to each other. So again, that's that's something to, be, to, to raise some red flags that these, these three village centers in particular are, are stressed by the evolving competitive, competitive market. Uh, Hickory Ridge is mildly competitive. There's Four, there's four supermarkets that are competing within that close-in five-minute drive. But as we go through some of the other indicators, you'll see that Hickory Ridge appears a little better when you look at densities and income levels. So as I mentioned, we, we think the three long reach clearly with, with the vacancy of the supermarket. Owen Brown and Oakland Mills are somewhat challenged with respect to this competitive environment. Uh, and, and we also want to stress the the continuing competition of the non-supermarket venues like Walmart. And I think Tom mentioned at the last presentation, Walmart currently accounts for about a quarter of all food sales in the United States, so it's nothing that you can ignore. And it's not just Walmart, it's the Costco's, it's the BJ's, it's all the other non-traditional supermarkets that are competing with your supermarkets today at the village centers. Um, and we, we, the other important takeaway here is that if the supermarket anchor is challenged, then it also is very challenging for those other retailers smaller scale retailers, uh, dining establishments uh, to, to be viable in the long term because they're losing that anchor that draws traffic to the village center. So again, it's another red flag that we just wanted to, to people to be aware of. The second factor we looked at was population density. And again, we, we looked at these drive times because that's what the supermarkets and the retailers look at. So we, the first column is a uh, five minute drive, the second is a 10 minute drive. No surprise, River Hill is the least densely populated within a five minute drive. But the, on the upside, there's very little competition for River Hill and River Hill is effectively serving Western Columbia. Uh, if you look at Oakland Mills, you can see that the five minute drive time there is close to 7,000. Again, it's lower density, but unlike River Hill, it's very competitive. So again, Oakland Mills is challenged because of lower densities in a very competitive environment. 
Then if you, if you flip to the bottom of, the, of this chart here and you see the most densely populated village centers are Hickory Ridge and Harper's Choice. So again, some positive signs, positive indicators for those two village centers because the densities are much higher within that critical five minute drive of the village centers. Next indicator that we looked at is household income and retailers will always uh, consider this when they're doing their market research. And I think no surprise that if you were to go to the bottom of the chart, we have our most affluent village centers in terms of close and resident market being River Hill, uh, Hickory Ridge, and Dorsey Search. And another, another important fact that I wanted to point out with respect to household income is retailers have found that if household income levels are higher, there's typically a greater propensity to eat out. And so that is also a positive indicator when you're trying to attract more restaurants to your village centers. So again, those three village centers uh, stack up fairly well look, in terms of median household income. And then finally, the last market indicator that we focused on was visibility. And I, I think we all know there's visibility and access issues with the village centers when it was developed. Uh, that wasn't one of the major concerns in terms of where these were placed. But today, with retailers looking at visibility and access as a major criteria, it factors in uh, very highly with trying to attract new tenants here. So River Hill, uh, again, shows up positively. It's right on 108. There's good visibility off a of major arterial. All of the other village centers tend to be somewhat hidden behind, in, within the neighborhoods. There's visibility issues, so that's something to consider, again, with trying to secure new tenants. Uh, Dorsey's search, we put it as moderate, moderate access just because it's close to 29, but again, visibility is an issue. It's still hidden back in the neighborhood, and, and visibility is still an issue there. So just summing up, these are kind of the major takeaways from those four market indicators. Again, visibility. Uh, River Hill is, is really the, one of the best performing uh, centers in terms of market factors, high visibility, uh, little competition, very affluent. And then Oakland Mills, again, very challenged in terms of the competitive environment and also in terms of lower densities close in within that five minute drive. And then Dorsey Search, uh, if you'll remember back on the slides, it was relatively lower density, but the competition was, was not as intense as some of the other centers like Owen Brown and Oakland Mills. So it's faring really better because of that and also because the income levels are higher. Uh, Hickory Ridge and Harper's Choice, as I pointed out earlier, are some of the most affluent close-in resident markets. So again, that's a positive market factor. And then the three outliers, Dorsey Search, King's Contrivance, and River Hill, all benefit from being out just by virtue of their, their outlying location within Columbia, so the competition, again, is very limited for those three. Again, a positive sign in terms of the market. And then we wanted to touch on a few factors. Market, market factors are important, but they're certainly not the only thing that make uh, retailers make a decision of where they're gonna locate. Some of the other issues that we wanted to highlight, ownership and management are critical if the owner or the management company is really vested in making, making a go of these village centers, that's a critical factor. You could have uh, magnificent market indicators, but if there's no vested interest in the operator, then the village center could suffer from that. Uh, the other issue that we wanted to raise is physical layout and configuration. So a lot of these village centers were developed, as you all know, years ago, and physical needs for a lot of the retailers have changed. We, we've raised the issue of visibility, and the, another issue to raise here is that retailer formats have changed. And I, I think a good example here is the banking industry. Uh, banks now, are, for example, are looking at tellerless branches, which are much smaller, much more narrow, um, and that will impact trying to release some of these spaces in these older village centers because they're not the space configuration that some of these new retailers are looking for. So again, just some other factors to keep in mind besides just the market indicators. Okay, uh, let's talk a little about uh, the GEDS corridor. As we said, it's different. It's a different kind of entity, different kind of land use, different kind of way of functioning within Columbia. Um, it has a number of different things going on. Uh, one of the things that we've noted, particularly around Dobbin Road, is that some of those older flex spaces, the office flex spaces, as we said last time, many of those have turned into nail slots. We don't know how many people are getting their nails done, but it must be a lot, uh, because you have a lot of them. 
and they're converting out of, uh, of what had been uh, light industrial distribution, uh, R&D space, some of the older building products where the rents are, are uh, likely lower. So we suspect that because of the strength of that, that retail market, some of the retail that's growing there is a result of that lack of supply elsewhere. Uh, but it makes kind of a mixed bag uh, in the Dobbin Road Quarter. Um, but one of the primary uses in the GEDS area is industrial. So Tom is going to talk for a minute about the character of industrial use and occupancy at the moment. Uh, just quickly, if, if I may, uh, Howard County has about 31 million square feet of industrial space. And then the number below that, the 11 and a half million, is what the industry defines as flex space. And that could be uh, like a woodworking shop that has a front in the back, and the front end is occupied by its sales office or its administrative functions. So it, by definition, it is inherently flexible. And Gantz has uh, some of that as well, uh, but it, it's a fairly sizable portion of Howard County's broader industrial market. And I think that the, it, it, the the zoning and the planning issues surrounding that, and, and certainly market issues, need to be inherently flexible to accommodate varying tenants who need that sort of space. Typically, uh, the industry defines it as sort of an 80-20 split, where you've got 20% front-end office and the 80% sort of back-of-house other functions uh, that are a little bit more industrial. Uh, right now, the, um, over the past eight years, uh, the absorption, again, the leasing activity is about 200,000 square feet a year. So again, using the example of Howard County General Hospital, which is 206,000 square feet. So you're, you're, the county as a whole is absorbing about one Howard County General Hospital in terms of industrial space annually, all over the county. The, um, in Geds, there's about 4.3 million square feet. And the, the notable number here is that over the last eight years, because of the hit when GE vacated, GE vacated, I think, 1.5 million square feet of space. And the Dutch pension fund that owns that property has done an extraordinary job of releasing that space. Of the 1.5 million that, that departed, if you will, uh, they've leased back about 990,000 square feet of that. But over this wider eight-year window, the absorption has still been negative, so there was a huge hit, and the Geds corridor, study area, is, from an industrial perspective, is, is in recovery right now. And so what we want to see is continued positive absorption, again, leasing, over the next several years to turn that negative 61,000 into a, a positive. The other, the other note on that slide is that all of the industrial in Columbia is in the GEDS corridor in that greater area that we uh, showed on the map earlier. Um, now, in thinking about, okay, is there development opportunity? Is there growth opportunity? Is there a market opportunity? Um, we wa wanted to say, well, is there any land available? And within the Gibbs study area and the immediate vicinity, uh, an informal analysis was done uh, by the Columbia Association, and it identified that there are seven uh, parcels. In some cases, these are two that can be combined that are adjacent. Uh, but there are seven parcels uh, using uh, 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 a sort of threshold of where does it make sense to look at a site. Um, there are seven parcels totaling almost a little over 67 acres that are zoned commercial. So that could be flex, office, any number of things. Uh, and there are another five parcels uh, zoned industrial currently. Um, they kind of are all over the map, literally and figuratively. Some of them uh, enjoy great access, uh, some off the gateway loop. Uh, uh, there are uh, uh, about a little less than half uh, zone commercial, um, but there are a couple of sites by 175 uh, together that have very high visibility, but you can't get there from 175. So you can see them, but you can't get there. You have to kind of loop back around and take some back roads. So these are not sites that are, are sitting there saying, come invest on me right now. They're not without challenges, but they are vacant land. So there is vacant land. The point of this one is there is a considerable amount of vacant land uh, in the Gets corridor areas and in the vicinity of those. Now, vacant doesn't mean developable. 
so when you look at that 140 plus acres we don't know how many of those have uh, environmental issues have sloped terrain issues um, we don't know why they haven't redeveloped so far so there is developable land of some size but we don't have a final acreage but if you're an investor or you're looking for a prospect for redevelopment in Columbia you might look at that and say well do I want to have to acquire existing buildings from multiple owners potentially uh, and try and put those together and tear them down and build something new or do I want to try and start with a vacant parcel where I can go ground down so it just is a competitive factor to so say you've got some developable land of some size within Columbia, uh, some of it commercial, some industrial, uh, but you also have other parcels that over time may be demo sites where you blade them and start over. It's just more complicated. So you have some of both of those. Uh, there are also, uh, we don't know what the infrastructure capacity is uh, in a lot of these vacant parcels. So it's there, but it's not like it's ready to roll tomorrow. Um, the Geds area is also a very, as Patty said, a very competitive retailing environment, both within the quarter and immediately adjacent across 175. Just in these four centers alone, Dobbin Center, Columbia Crossing 1 and 2, Gateway Overlook, and Dobbin uh, Square, uh, there's a little over 1.8 million square feet of retail space. That's a lot. Uh, they're, they're almost completely full. They have almost no vacancy whatsoever, extraordinarily high occupancy. So you've got a lot of space and it's full. And who's in them? Well, you have almost every big box, large format retailer, discount retailer, everybody is in this market because Howard County is a strong affluent residential base. So you've got the concentration and you've got the stores and they're all here right together. So in terms of competition for the village centers, this is a very powerful competitive environment when somebody says, well, we'd like to have more dress stores or men's apparel stores or, or shoe stores in the village centers, it's going to be particularly challenging to compete with the powerhouse that these national chain affiliated tenants represent very close by and in close proximity. It's not saying you can't get some of that, but it's going to be really difficult. So that's why we keep thinking about how do the village centers fit within their own context and their own submarkets, and then how do they fit in the greater Columbia market. Um, so, uh, uh, in addition to that, we have 1.2 million square feet of new retail planned in the downtown area, redevelopment in uh, downtown Columbia, where there's already a big concentration of destination and comparison shopping retail, and more food and beverage and Whole Foods coming. So, this just says, where do we stand today, and we know there's a lot of strong competition out there. Now, looking ahead, We've been in, in a number of discussions internally about well, what do we really think uh, the market direction could be here? Should it be residential? Should we change from industrial to residential? Should we retain industrial? Should we encourage more retail and where? Where should it go? So to put that into perspective, because very often governmental units will say, well, we're going to go, and this is, happens a lot in Florida, they'll say, well, we're going to redo our downtown and pitch it toward the tourist market. Well, when you look at actual spending, what people spend on a day-to-day -day basis, and you look at the required sales productivity, and those of you who were here at the last session, we talked about that kind of threshold of the relationship between rent and what people sell, and that if you don't hit a certain level of rent, the landlord can't afford to invest because there's not enough return. So if you assume uh, typical investment grade industry standards of $250 to $300 a square foot in sales productivity, and typical not high and not low income expenditure potentials, what people actually spend. Each new resident that you bring in to Columbia will support somewhere nearby, somewhere between four and seven square feet of retail space at those industry average productivity and sales numbers. If you compare that to office workers, every new employee you bring in will support somewhere between two and five square feet of retail space. Now what does that mean? Well, if you have a lot of retail close by, because an office worker says, I've got a limited lunch hour, I've got something I need to buy, if it's close by and I can do it, I'll go spend. If it's not close by or what I want's not available, I may have money in my pocket, but I'm not going to spend it. So to put that into perspective, two square feet per new employee would be on the sort of suburban um, uh, undersupplied character and five square feet would be um, downtown Chicago, where you've got a lot of density and you've got a lot of stores nearby. 
So there's a spectrum across there. The resident spending is a little bit more um, predictable because people will seek things out. Office workers, it has to be convenient, even if they have the money to spend. Oddly enough, or not surprisingly, the lowest spend and the lowest supportable comes from visitors. It's not to say they're not important, but if you're only going to get a half a square foot to one and a half square feet of retail per visitor, typically, you better have a lot of visitors if you're planning on having a lot of retail. Now, ideally, the, the village centers will capture the resident expenditure, the downtown is going to capture office, uh, resident, and visitor, and the Geds area can capture office worker expenditures, uh, resident expenditures along the major arterials, and 70, 175 is a big draw for all those markets, but the visitor market you know, that's really going to be driven by whatever happens with Mary with the Post events and other kinds of events you have that bring in people from outside of Columbia. So, relatively speaking, your most important market for future growth is going to be the resident market and the office market, and that argues for consideration of density, which is one of the crossroads that you're at since the original plan is pretty much built out and we're now looking forward to Columbia and saying, what else can we have in support? Okay, so to summarize about GEDS, um, we have a uh, near-term uh, continuing conversion of some of that office flex space, particularly around Dobbin. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll see, I hope we don't see too many more nail shops. We want to see you stay in business. Uh, but, you know, there's going to be continued conversion, uh, restaurants, carry-out restaurants, and some of those flex spaces. One of the other things we heard early on in the stakeholder visit uh, meetings with um, brokers was some of these loft-type office spaces where they're raw space, they're kind of industrial in character, they're kind of cool, a lot of young and tech and startup businesses like that character. The fit up cost is lower, the rent is lower, it's easier to enter the market. So we think we'll continue to see some of those things happen in the buildings that are literally flex, flexible enough to accommodate it, uh, as well as some retained industrial and light uh, assembly and the kind of things that fit in the flex space that Tom talked about. Um, it, are there are potentials to consolidate spaces and create new things um, and create some new options, but that will remain to be seen about which sites they are. There are very site-specific considerations, particularly on that vacant land and parcels we're talking about. There is market support today within GET for about 235,000 square feet of office space, additional, between 2015 and 2020, but because of the vacancy rate of what exists today, that can fit in almost completely with one within space you've already built. Now, will all of it go there? Well, probably not. Uh, but you've got a lot of vacant space, and that's likely to fill first because you've got motivated owner developers who are saying, I need some rent. I'll make a deal with you. And that's going to slow down the opportunity for new office development in the Gets Corridor for a while, at least till you get some of those stabilized occupancies that Tom mentioned earlier. There's market support for a modest amount of 122,000 feet of industrial based on past trends in 2020. But again, you've got vacant space in industrial, so that's likely to go in as well. It'll all fit in the existing space you've got. New target industries, as economic development strategies proceed and we look forward, those kinds of things will help transform this down the line and we'll be addressing some of those target industries in the next go round of the recommendations. Okay, so the, the market potentials in the village centers, as, as Tom said earlier, no village center will support more than about another 3,500 feet of space. This is based, has been based on existing conditions in the top line. So professional offices in the village centers varying from location to location, uh, with GIDS supporting that 236. Food and beverage, we talked last time, is an opportunity and we a, a chance, we think, for retail mix refinement and addition of stronger operators and new operators in the village centers. Uh, the projected food and beverage service, uh, about 4,000 feet in Long Reach as it exists today, potential to do more as it evolves, Oakland Mills, 6100, and so on across the line. Um, River Hill, affluent, uh, not much competition, doing pretty well. Um, you know, food tends to aggregate, and people seem to believe you can get more restaurants in, but it's pretty stable. So we're really talking about uh, two to three restaurants, additional restaurants supportable today in most of the village centers. Hickory Ridge, uh, no incremental opportunity at the moment for Harper's Choice for the reasons Patty outlined. Uh, no, one of the early questions that we were asked was, 
what's the future for supermarkets? Well, as Patty said, we have a couple of distressed locations in Longreach with a vacancy in Oakland Mills with a lot of competition. Uh, we don't see room for any additional grocery stores, and I don't think that'll come as a surprise when you look at the number of them that you have in Columbia now. So can you keep your grocery stores? Yes, we think those are gonna remain fairly stable, but we think there are stresses, uh, certainly in Longreach with the vacancy and in Oakland Mills as well. Um, an industrial, as we said, 122,000 feet, but it will all fit in the vacant side. Okay. Um, so what does this mean in general for all the market findings? Well, it means that because your growth has been fairly modest uh, and the vacancies have been uh, diminishing but are still there, there is um, uh, modest demand and that will fit it with what you've already got. If you look at the village centers, you have modest demand for increase over the next five to seven years. But what you uh, don't have today will fit largely within vacant space or very modest expansion. The, the vacancies will absorb it. So we're not looking at a whole lot of new buildings being built in the village centers uh, for retail and office space. The loss of a grocery store, uh, we can see the effects of that in Long Reach. These were conceived of and tend to operate as grocery anchored neighborhood serving centers. And without that anchor use, if you don't have that anchor use, you're gonna need some fairly major redirection in order to sustain traffic and draw additional traffic. So if you don't have a grocery store or lose a grocery store, we need to find something else, and it may not be a grocery store, that fits in the space, that works well, provides a community destination, a service, and a draw, because that's what the other retailers that originally depended on the grocery stores will depend on. Um, same issue with the industrial and GEDs we mentioned. How could this change? And this is where we're gonna be focused over the next six weeks or so, or uh, four weeks or so. An exceptionally large space user coming into the Columbia market could alter the current land uses in GEDS in particular, whether it's a major industrial user, whether it is a, a major office headquarters location. If Amazon says, we're gonna put our mid-Atlantic distribution center in GEDS, that would change the character of everything. But we don't know where that situation stands at the moment. So for the near term, we're sort of treading water, holding even, we're roughly in proportion. We don't see giant changes coming based on recent market trends. So now the challenge for us is to look ahead and say what can we do with opportunities yet to come. Um, we did, as, as Tom said, there is the possibility of one more limited service hotel in the Gets quarter, but that's going to be dependent on new office growth. And we've got vacant office space to fill, so probably further out rather than more immediate. Uh, there is a near-term office opportunity in Columbia. People want to live here. Between the quality of life and the schools and where you are and the jobs in the area, this is a desirable place to live. Based on some of those planned numbers, there's room in the market uh, by 2020 for 2,600 to 3,500 new units at least. And the difference there is how many people live in those households. So if you look at the 2,600 units, that's based on the countywide average household size of about two and a half people. If you look at the 3,500 units, that's more directed toward who we think the likely residents are gonna be downtown. Uh, older empty nesters who are saying, I don't wanna keep the lawn anymore, but I wanna stay in Columbia. Young professionals who want the urban lifestyle and the amenities nearby. If you look at other urban residential developments like this in the mid-Atlantic, those are the primary markets. You don't get as many people with kids, although you get some, who want that lifestyle. So as those 400 units open this year and 400 more next year, uh, we'll see how that fit goes, but if you look at other models, that's how it's worked. So we think you're likely to have more smaller average household sizes. That's about one, the 3,500 is 1.9, so less than two. So we think that's likely to be the, the, the character model, or the, the personality and the characteristics model for downtown housing and the downtown Columbia housing developments underway. Um, village center housing opportunities, as Tom said, uh, very low vacancy, so clearly people want to be here and they're looking for things, but Wild Lake for us will be an enormous barometer because it's a new product type in the village center that hasn't existed for a long time or ever. So we're very curious to see how that's going to shake out uh, and look at pre-leasing and pre-sales and, and use of the retail space. All of these conditions could change based on several opportunities. One is increased density, 
If you decide in the planning process to increase density significantly, that will affect everything else. Office and residential density will absolutely affect the retail character and the supportable amount that you have if you want more. Uh, you can refine the mix based on induced market opportunities because that's something we see as a, a chance to change the character, particularly of the village centers, uh, that may not be performing at as high a level. What can we build on there to strengthen them and address some of the, the market-based challenges in density and spending power that exist today? So that's where we lead up to the next presentation, which will uh, look at specific recommendations and tactics and strategies and things that we think will help make this possible to meet this and hopefully exceed some of those market chances.